Hi, this is Miles Maria, the Soldier of Mary. So I've entitled this video, I think I've entitled it, something along the lines of Disagreements Between Mystics. How to make sense of them. And that's because I know it's a topic I'm interested in and maybe some of you are interested in. If you've read some of these lives of our Lord and, and His Holy Mother, if you've read Anne Catherine Emmerich, Venerable Mary of Agreda, maybe Maria Valtoya, Torta, maybe um, other ones. I know Maria Valtorta, maybe I shouldn't have said her because she's, uh, she's not really um, taken as an, an approved um, visionary. Writings of various fathers of the church, writings of St. Alphonsus. If you've read these different St. Bridget of Sweden, entirely approved by the church, if you've read these and you notice they don't always agree, how do we make sense of that? And I've thought about this quite a lot, and I've got a number of suggestions as to how we can work through this. Okay, so first of all, we have to divide between apostolic tradition and insights from mystics. And we've got to put them in two categories. I mentioned about this in one of my videos quite recently. Um, so this video, let's say, is going to be just on the mystics, because when we're dealing with traditions like, uh, let's say, St. Cyril of Jerusalem tells us something that our Lord purportedly did. And let's say that um, Cyril of Alexandria says something different. And he says our Lord didn't go to um, um, Spain. Uh, he went to uh, Galilee, you know. I know Cyril of Alexander doesn't say our Lord went to Jerusalem, doesn't say our Lord went to Spain, but just for example, um, something that's completely uh, incorrect. One of them is, says one thing, incompatible. Um, well, in that case, we can just say that, that they, one of them received an incorrect tradition. And that the, or sometimes you can say that um, they received a partially true tradition, um, but had some error in it as well, and they, um, or the, and the error got expanded. Let's say, for instance, if if some father of the church said um, at the wedding feast of Cana, our Lord um, changed uh, water um, into wine, and it was uh, it only became known to be wine when Our Lady drank it. You know, it would be a tradition that was was false in part but true in other parts and those cases we just say it's down to human error the fathers of the church aren't infallible and so they've um they've picked up a um a mistaken tradition um but what about the um what about the mystics uh, how does it work with the mystics because normally when we think of the mystics we're kind of imagining we're kind of imagining the the saint being transported to the actual time and place of our lord and his holy mother that's what we're thinking and seeing like like for example on a, on a television uh like a hidden camera seeing what hidden camera going back in time seeing what went on um and so if that's the case how is it that saint bridget um can say that the pillar that our lord is scourged in is different from all three of them give different descriptions of the pillar the, by three i mean mary of agreda um and Catherine emmerich and bridget of sweden they all give slightly different descriptions of the pillar uh, what it looks like where it is um what it's made of how do we how do we make sense of that if they're all fly on the wall going back in time and seeing the uh, uh the scourging taking place um we can apply some of the rules of um, that we apply to um, harmonizations of the Gospels, right? For instance, we go about harmonizing the different Gospel accounts of various events. And sometimes the way of harmonizing is you say that the author emphasized one thing in order to make a certain theological point. And it's the theological point that he wants to convey rather than the literal uh, order of events. Like, for instance, they talk about... Um, uh, Saint Luke in the temptations of our Lord in the desert makes the one um, uh, in Jerusalem on the temple the final one in order to they say have the devil uh, in Jerusalem still 
and to kind of focus our minds on Jerusalem, whereas St. Matthew puts the order with the final two in a, in a different order, because that's not his overarching concern in his kind of literary construction. So, you know, but the thing is, that's okay if you're dealing with someone that is... Um, uh, the, the gospel writers, I guess, I guess the gospel writers aren't necessarily putting themselves as the fly on the wall, giving us a minute by minute account. They're definitely not doing that. St. Mark's gospel gives us a day in the life of Jesus that probably contains things that he did on other days. Um, and maybe some of St. Matthew's gospel gives us sayings of our Lord in one section that may have been said um over a period of time but the whole point certainly of emmerich and um Agrida, and at times of of bridget is a minute by minute second by second seemingly literal account of events um or that purports to be literal one approach would be to say okay i only accept one of them and the other two are um inauthentic but that approach is not necessarily wise because all three have been very well approved and have got great supporters. Holy popes and um, saints have, have taken them very seriously. Um, and also we don't need to take that approach. Um, I think that the best approach um, oh, I'll just mention the other, my other favorite, one of my favorite examples is about whether, whether um, St. Anne and St. Joachim are alive, are alive at the um, time of, that our Lord is born. Um, Venerable Mary of Agreda says that they both have died. Um, Venerable, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich says Anne has died, but not Joachim. And St. Bridget of Sweden, she doesn't tell us. Um, and possibly they're both alive. Um, no, she doesn't really. She doesn't tell us. So, so, um, so we have another striking difference because Venerable Mary actually says they definitely died while Our Lady was in the temple and gives quite quite a thorough account of of all that went on. So, you know, to deal with this. I think ultimately the best way of doing it is for us to try and um, to try and understand these visions um, not necessarily as the fly on the wall of the saint being transported back in time and being there. I think it's much better to try and realize that their soul uh, is interacting with what occurred um, but it's also interacting with all that other people have thought about those events okay that sounds a bit weird now but you know if, if you if you take an our ideas our our Thoughts are just as real as our as our bodies. Thoughts are real, and they're not entire. They're not um, genuine thoughts. Are um, distinct a distinct substance from from matter. They're immaterial, and yet um, thought clothes matter, and thoughts clothe events. What I mean is, so. Um, my thoughts um my thoughts my decision can transform a tree into a a tree stump into a chair um for a whole community of people that was previously a a tree stump but now my thoughts have made that a chair because i've used it as a chair and i understand it as a chair and it gains a, a, a bigger meaning a different meaning from the one it had and that kind of meaning that I gave it as tree stump continues uh, as the community recognizes it now as as tree stump um, and they pick up that meaning okay that's an analogy really for what I'm going to say now and that is that um, in some way when we think about an event in the past it's possible 
for our thoughts to kind of create a noise or a layers upon the event in the past that a mystic would be sensitive to. So when the mystic, through their soul, through their mind, is brought back into the past, not only do they interact with actual events, actual, uh, actual, uh, re actual, um, uh, the actual uh, actions of the people involved in those events at that particular moment in time, but they're also, I think, interacting with what other people have thought about those events, um, and particularly maybe other mystics who have um, interacted with those events. So, and also their own minds, they're also interacting with their own um, presuppositions as they go back and experience in some way the occurrence of the events. So basically what I'm suggesting is that the transporting back in time to see the event is much richer and much um, more um, layered than just seeing through a video camera. There is an element of that, but there's also an element of the seer interacting with their own presuppositions, interacting with what they have read about that event, maybe what they've read in other mystics, in the fathers of the church, in the gospels, um, maybe pictures that they saw in, in um, storybooks when they're growing up of various details. And also they're interacting with the layers of meaning that other minds have left on those events because men, because thought is real and it does change reality. Now, I, I kind of, part of my evidence for this is listening to Jimmy Akin on his Mysterious World talking about remote viewing, which uh, seems like a real thing. It's really possible that someone can be trained to see an object very, very far away by, by their mind stretching out um, across space time. Mind is, is invisible and it's a separate, it's a substance distinct from matter and it can, um, is capable of this. Um, remote viewers observe, you know, and, and it's testable, verifiable. They can observe things in other countries um far beyond their their any physical capability they can observe things and describe them that are then verified but sometimes there's noise sometimes there's noise where the thoughts of others seem to affect the reading that they pick up i think so for instance maybe that um um, if a lot of people were thinking, um, let's say the remote viewer was, was being asked to see a house, um, a particular house in Alaska, and maybe a team of 10 viewers were asked to see it, but one was asked to see it and the other nine were asked to think about it and imagine it, that particular house as having a, a red door. And there's a there's a genuine phenomenon in in remote viewing of of that thinking that collective thinking of, of the red door as being noise that the other remote viewer has to has to try to try and pass through um, in order to get to the reality and so maybe we're coming to the conclusion now. So maybe the differences of um, accounts of the various mystics can be put down to some of this meditative noise of, of pious people through all the ages seeing an event in a certain way. Um, of course, it's entirely possible for God to help them pierce through that and to give genuine historical insights, but there's always going to be an admixture of noise, 
there's going to be an admixture of their own presuppositions and that I think somewhat can help us to um, explain the differences between the the various mystics also it may be that God has willed in order to teach us for certain um, permitted maybe maybe I should say permitted rather than willed um, God has permitted certain things to be relayed like for instance maybe Venerable Mary of Agrida conveying that relaying that our lady's parents died while she was in the temple maybe that was permitted by God maybe it was some noise maybe it wasn't genuine but maybe that was permitted by God for its instruction to us because the um, reaction that Venerable Mary of Agrita attributes to Our Lady is very instructive for us because she has a genuine sadness about this about the death of her parents she's genuinely sad about it and it really um, adds extra color to Our Lady to our meditation of her maybe maybe the maybe one of the complications of Venerable Mary of Agrita was that maybe some other dear relatives of Our Lady did die and so maybe she's during her time in the temple so maybe she's kind of picking up on that um, or maybe she was correct maybe they did die although I'm of the view with Catherine Emmerich on this one and some other uh, saints that, that they that they lived or at least um, Anne lived in order to be with um, uh, the baby Jesus and to be with as a grandmother so these are just some thoughts about how we reconcile the mystics that sometimes god permits an error between them for our greater enlightenment enlightenment on a particular uh, virtue of our lady or our lord um, that even the error can be useful uh, to almighty god to help instruct us and teach us i don't think you see we, we don't need to go down the route of saying that that some of the saints are being disingenuous or dishonest it's quite possible that they genuinely believe that they are receiving these things um, but like I said noise has um, through other other people's thoughts through their own um, presuppositions um, have clouded them from giving a hundred percent conveyance of what physically occurred um, so I hope that that helps you and maybe you've i'd really love to see uh, maybe this video has gone way too long but please share with me um what you think about this and how you go about reconciling the difference among the saints and mystics in their accounts on the life of our lord and our lady in the name of the father and the son the holy spirit amen